Hello, everybody. Welcome to the second installment of Interface. I'm Vahid Aryadus from the National Institute of Education of Nanyang Technological University. Uh, I have the pleasure to host the second installment to, uh, as you know, Interface seminars are intended to bring together neuroscience, artificial intelligence, and assessment validity, and anything that has to do with language and, and, and measurement. Uh, with rapid developments in AI and neuroscience in recent years, new approaches to education, learning, and assessment have been emerging. With the promise of AI and neuroscience come concerns about the ethical uses of these technologies. Specifically, there has been a debate on the, base, uh, on the basis of uh, uh, the bias uh, of AI-based decision-making. In addition, the level playing field in terms of fair opportunities to use AI technologies uh, in education has been an area of concern. The speaker of today's seminar is Dr. Xiaoming Shi, who has uh, extensive experience in language assessment and educational technologies and also AI. Uh, Xiaoming is currently Director of Examinations, Assessment and Research at the Hong Kong Examinations and Assessment Authority leading the uh, Assessment Technology and Research Division, the International and Professional Examinations Division, and the Education Assessment Services Division. Her research spans broad areas of theory and practice, including validity and fairness issues in the broader context of test use, test validation methods, validity frameworks for automated scoring of speech, the role of technology in language assessment and learning, as well as test design. She has published widely on testing, assessment, learning, and on educational AI technologies. She serves on the editorial boards of a few leading international journals, and she's been awarded multiple patents in AI technology and won several prestigious book and article awards in educational testing. Prior to her current position in Hong Kong, uh, she was uh, Chief of Product Assessment and Learning at, at VIP, VIPKIT International, the Senior Research Director in Research and Development um, and Executive Director in New Product Development at, at, in, uh, at Educational Testing Service, or ETS. She obtained her doctoral degree in Educational Measurement and Statistics and Language Assessment from the University of California, Los Angeles. Her topic for today's seminar is very exciting. It's validity of automated scoring in the era of machine learning and big data. Uh, it's a terrific pleasure to welcome you, Xiaoming. I would like to pass the time to you, not to take the time too much. Well, thank you, Vahid, uh, for the very nice introduction. Uh, my name is Xiaoming Xi, and I recently relocated to Hong Kong. Uh, after the travel restrictions uh, were lifted. Uh, I currently work at uh, the Hong Kong Examinations and Assessment Authority, uh, and uh, I've been working there for about a month and a half, uh, really enjoying it. Uh, it's a great opportunity to talk about uh, validity of automated scoring, especially in this modern age of machine learning and big data. Uh, so before I get started, I'd like to ask you two quick questions, uh, and I believe that uh, you can answer it uh, on your screen uh, if I can get the technology to work here. Uh, so I'm going to open uh, the poll. So can you see the question on the screen? Bahid, can you see it? Yes, yes. Great. Okay. Yes, I so can see. suppose you are a user, uh, and if an automated scoring test provider tells you that their engine can produce scores that emulate your human rater agreement, will you use the engine to replace human scoring? Wow. Okay. The pattern is very clear here. Okay, great. Overwhelmingly, I think a lot of you are saying you need more information to decide. So we've got some very savvy users uh, about this group. Okay, uh, I'm going to end the poll here. 
uh, and, um, and look at the results. Uh, so the majority of you are saying you're going to need more information to decide. In reality, I think a lot of users would probably just take that as the single piece of evidence, right? And then adopt the use. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's uh, really interesting here. Uh, and I'm really glad to see that. Uh, and let me launch the second question, uh, which is kind of similar, uh, but slightly different. So it's a test of both your reading and listening comprehension. Uh, if an automated uh, scoring test provider tells you that their scoring model is a black box and hard to decipher, but it can emulate your human rater agreement, will you consider using it? And I'm still seeing a sort of a pattern here. Um, interesting results. Okay. So uh, look at the results. Uh, and about 30% of you would just straightly say, no, I'm not going to use it because, you know, it's a black box. And, 60% uh, of you in saying that you need more information to decide. Um, so that's, that's great. Uh, so that means we got uh, very savvy users here and I wish all the users are uh, like you guys uh, because in the, in the real world, uh, they will probably just take whatever, right? Uh, they get and uh, usually just use uh, so the human uh, automated agreement as the single piece of evidence uh, for their adoption. So when Vahit uh, proposed this topic of the validity of automated scoring, and I was thinking, what has changed uh, in recent years, right? And I've started to write about this topic since the early 2000s. And I think I'm seeing a few new things, a, new, uh, a few new trends here. Uh, the first one is that uh, there have been a lot more uses of automated scoring uh, for high stakes purposes. And 20 years ago, you know, if an automated scoring provider announced that uh, uh, they were going to uh, support a high stakes test, right? Uh, that they were going to be adopted by a high stakes test. Uh, and it would probably, you know, create a huge stir in the media. Uh, right now, I think users are just getting used to it. Uh, it really doesn't make news headlines uh, anymore. Uh, another trend that I'm seeing is that there has been a lot more variation in how uh, automated scoring is applied and how it's being used all the way from the very high stakes uh, purposes to a practice purpose where automated scoring is being used to provide diagnostic feedback. Uh, another recent trend uh, is the growing popularity of deep learning methods. Uh, and a lot of them are actually black boxes, right? Uh, as uh, you know, uh, you just responded to some survey questions and it raises some interesting questions about validity. Uh, you know, do we want to adopt the use of uh, deep learning models or not? Uh, because they are black boxes. And more recently, I think due to the pandemic, um, a lot of test providers couldn't test, right? So the users, uh, they needed the scores for decision-making, for making admissions decisions or other types of um, you know, high stakes decisions. So they've become a lot less selective in the test that they accept. Uh, it will be interesting to see uh, whether this is here to stay or whether this trend is going to change after the pandemic is over. Uh, so given all these developments, and I would say that um, you know, the validity considerations regarding automated scoring need to be updated um, because if you know, 
uh, if all, the, all these validity frameworks uh, would just, you know, be what's on paper, right, and they just become the topic of academic debates, then they can't really provide any guidance uh, for users to deal with some of the pressing issues that they are facing right now. So tracing back to some of the earlier work on the validity of automated scoring, uh, I think Yang et al. Uh, has summarized it well, that the earlier research uh, used one or more of the three approaches to look at the relationship between automated and human scores and between automated scores and criteria measure scores, or uh, trying to understand making sense of the scoring features and the models and see how they are related to the construct that we want to measure. And about 20 years ago, then uh, we started to see some advances in the theoretical work. Uh, in either trying to tie automated scoring into the overall assessment process or into the overall validity argument. Um, and for example, Bennett and Bahar, uh, they try to see uh, and sort of situate automated scoring into this bigger uh, computerized assessment development process, although they didn't focus on the validation of automated scoring. Uh, they sort of hinted at, um, you know, the complexity of the validation work that involves automated scoring. And later, I think Clauser, King, and Swenson, um, you know, tried to integrate automated scoring into this uh, overall validity argument. Uh, and they tried to argue that the use of automated scoring could potentially strengthen or weaken uh, certain aspects of the validity argument. And in some of my own work, uh, I try to provide a more detailed analysis of all sorts of validity issues introduced by automated scoring. And then I map them to the validity uh, inferences in the validity argument. And if you look at the whole list, and you would probably become desperate uh, because the list is long and there are a lot of validity issues. Uh, so it's impossible for a test provider to do research on every aspect. And so we've got to prioritize. Uh, and so that's why I also argue that validation priorities should be determined by how automated scoring is implemented and also how uh, the scores are being used. And uh, is it going to be used as the sole rater, as a check, or as a second rater? Is it going to be used for high stakes purposes, medium stakes, or low stakes? And depending on, on any combination of these two factors, then your burden of validity evidence would be different. So, you know, looking at the whole evolution of uh, the development of uh, uh, theories regarding the validity of automated scoring, uh, it started from this initial piecemeal approach, right, uh, where researchers only focused on one aspect of uh, validity of automated scoring uh, to this more systematic approach um, that sees automated scoring as an integral part of uh, the assessment development process or the validity argument to uh, attempts to look at uh, validity issues in a more comprehensible way and also uh, you know, to prioritize uh, these different validity inquiries. So I think uh, probably the majority of you are very familiar with uh, uh, Kane's validity argument, right? Uh, it sees test validation as providing evidence for a chain of inferences uh, from uh, you know, domain definition, uh, from test tasks to score-based decisions and test use. And um, you know, there are I think different researchers have proposed different uh, validity inferences, sort of building on King's uh, uh, overall framework. Uh, and the one uh, that I'm using here is from uh, Chappelle's work. 
And uh, you know, if you look at the first domain definition inference, uh, it concerns whether your items and tasks are representative of the domain and evaluation, uh, whether uh, the score is an accurate reflection of students' performance level and generalization, whether your score, observed score, can generalize to uh, similar tasks and uh, test forms and uh, occasions. And explanation, whether the observed score captures critical aspects of performance uh, that reflect underlying abilities. So I think this is a mouthful, right? Um, and how is it different from uh, evaluation here? Because we are looking at, uh, for evaluation, we are actually looking at um, whether the scores represent the, the uh, performance level. If you have an automated scoring engine, that only uses some lower level features to predict scores, but it does a fine job of predict, predicting human scores. In terms of evaluation, you're fine because your scores are accurate. Uh, but in terms of explanation, uh, it falls short of the expectation because you're not measuring the full spectrum, right, of uh, inferences there. Uh, and then, you know, uh, extrapolation, looking at the relationship between observed scores and criteria measure scores. Uh, utilization, looking at uh, how your scores, uh, to what extent they are useful for uh, decision making. And finally, you know, the consequences, right? Uh, whether they have positive uh, consequences. So when we add automated scoring, into this picture and everybody would think, well, it actually impacts the accuracy of the scores, which is very true, right? The immediate impact is actually on uh, the accuracy of the scores. Uh, however, I think we kind of overlook the fact that it actually has impact on all of the validity inferences in an argument. Uh, so take uh, explanation as an example. Uh, you know, if you use automated scoring, right, and, um, you know, because the, the limitations of your automated scoring uh, technology, it would actually determine what kind of tasks you would be able to uh, use. It would dictate everything. Uh, and that way, it would actually constrain uh, the kind of tasks that, that you can use in your test and that's compromising the domain definition uh, inference there. And I'm not going into detail about how automated scoring is going to uh, impact each of the inferences. I think you could look at some of the published work uh, to, to look for the details, uh, but uh, the, the essence here is that automated scoring actually has this uh, ripple effects, right? and all the way down to score-based decisions and test use. Um, so earlier on, I talked about this black box approach. Uh, and if you look at a lot of the communication about automated scoring providers there, they are almost always black boxes, right? Because they're unwilling to reveal uh, what they call the secret, uh, the trade secrets, right? Uh, and um, in some cases, the training model, the model that they train, uh, the automated scoring model is actually a black box itself. Uh, deep neural network is one example. Uh, it, it tries to mimic how the brain works. Uh, and I'm not sure whether we know how our brain works, right? We know it's very complex. Uh, so, you know, we got some input layers and different layers uh, and then the output layer, but look what's happening in the middle, right? Uh, there are these complex interactions among these different nodes at different layers uh, that are impossible to decipher there. So that is a major uh, limitation of uh, using deep learning models, uh, especially for some industries where there's very heavy regulation, like in medical science. 
and I think you know the U.S. FDA uh, I think would be very reluctant to approve any drug use or treatment method uh, based on a, a, a black box model uh, because life or death decisions are being involved here, right? Uh, and in education, we don't usually, uh, uh, you know, deal with life or death uh, decisions, uh, but some of the stakes are uh, still very high. And so that's why a lot of the researchers have started to look at, um, you know, how to improve the interpretability of deep learning models. Uh, some of the conceptual work, uh, for example, uh, Czech Rob Wardy uh, at all's work, uh, they try to unpack this concept of model transparency uh, into three different concepts. I think they are still kind of, uh, you know, related in some way. Uh, simulatability, uh, whether you could actually look at the input data, the model, and try to replicate uh, the calculations. Uh, decomposability, uh, whether you could intuitively interpret every parameter in the model. Uh, for example, a multiple regression model is very straightforward, right? For every increase in uh, X and you get uh, how many units of increase in Y, uh, but not for a deep learning model. Uh, the third dimension is the transparency of the algorithm, uh, whether you could actually interpret, uh, look at the inner workings of the algorithm. And again, it's impossible, right, to do that for some of the uh, deep learning models. So uh, some of the methods uh, that can help us and improve the interpretability of machine learning models. Uh, one example is uh, permutation feature importance. Uh, this is an example from uh, Belio uh, 2021 work uh, where uh, they try to use uh, uh, random forest, uh, which is a machine learning method uh, to predict housing prices. So what that um, you know, permutation feature importance does is that um, it actually shuffles the value of one variable at a time and see what's the impact on the error. In this case, they use uh, root mean square error. Uh, obviously, if you reshuffle the values of, for example, education, and you see a huge increase in the error of the uh, model prediction there, uh, that would mean that education is a very important variable, right? Uh, so that actually would give us some view uh, into uh, the relative importance of different features. Uh, it's not ideal, but at least I, I think it allows us uh, to interpret the relative importance of different features. So I think it's our dream, right, uh, to try to mimic the human scoring process. And I would say that given the current state of the art, this is an impossible goal. So I, you know, I don't think uh, it's, it's ever possible for us to use an automated scoring engine to mimic the human decision process because they are inherently different. Um, and we know human raters, uh, they make impressionistic judgments an automated scoring model is always algorithm-based or rule-based. Uh, and we tend to think that uh, we have the ability to think. Uh, we can justify or rationalize our decisions when, they, when we score, or which may not be the case. Uh, and uh, for automated scoring, it's purely just a prediction, right? Uh, prediction of uh, human scores uh, based on the human gold standard. And we know that automated scoring uh, is very, very good at uh, detecting tiny differences, uh, whereas I think that's a major weakness of our uh, decision-making process. Um, you know, automated scoring, uh, they, uh, an engine can separate different related constructs very easily. And uh, I think there's a lot of research on the halo effects of human scoring. And actually in uh, my own work uh, back uh, in the 20, uh, 2000, uh, where I look at the analytic scoring for the TOEFL speaking section, uh, the raters had a hard time separating very similar constructs. Um, 
And a very important distinction is that automated scoring at the moment uh, is extremely limited in assessing complex constructs and you know, don't be fooled by their uh, sort of communication about while well, they can score, uh, uh, you know, like coherence or organization or the quality of the development, um, topic development. Uh, if, if you look at, dig deeper into the features that they use, a lot of these features are surface features uh, that are probably at best proxies of these more complex constructs, but they can't really function the same way the human brain works uh, in assessing complex constructs. And there are all these other differences um, that are more obvious um, that I'm not getting into. So the gist of this table is that automated scoring and human scoring are as far apart as possible. So our goal shouldn't be to emulate uh, the decision-making process of uh, a human at this point. And in addition, I'm not sure like sometimes whether we could actually articulate right, our decision-making process when we score something. And this is especially true uh, when we use a rubric-based uh, uh, scoring method uh, and just look at a bunch of descriptors and make judgments. Uh, there's also, uh, I think, this uh, uh, new approach, uh, performance decision tree, uh, and uh, which is uh, reviewed in Vulture et al. 2011, where they use this kind of uh, decision tree to score a story retail task. Uh, so if you look at, uh, you know, here, it actually uses a, a series of uh, what if uh, kind of rules, right? Uh, if the story retail is coherent, uh, it goes to this bucket. Uh, if only includes a listing of uh, story elements, it goes to this bucket. Uh, and then it just continues on until you can put everybody into a score class. And interestingly, I think there's sort of a similar method in training automated scoring engines uh, in our work to train the first version of the speech reader. Uh, we also experimented with a classification tree. Uh, and here's a hypothetical example uh, if the speech rate is more than three words per second, uh, it goes to a higher score class, and if not, uh, goes to this class, right? So if you compare this one to the previous one, I think structurally it's very similar, but the decision-making process is still very different. And here you're looking at very granular features and the, the cutoffs are numeric scores, right? Whereas previously, I think in the classification tree, uh, at each step, you're still looking at uh, more like impressionistic judgment, whether the story retail is coherent or not, right? Um, so this is a, uh, another decision tree. This is a, actually a real example from our 2008 work. Uh, and using uh, automated features to predict uh, speaking scores. Uh, it's impossible for you to read, uh, so I'm going to blow up one note. Uh, so here, what we are looking at is a pronunciation score, acoustic model score. If it's greater than this cutoff value, uh, and then it will go to this class of two, score class of two. And then down below, we have another fluency feature, yet another fluency feature to decide whether, you know, you continue to stay in the class of two, right? Or you actually get classified into a one. This is a one here. Um, so, you know, this is, a, a, again, a series of what if, right? If you, you know, demonstrate this, uh, and then you will be in this bucket. Um, and so I have uh, another uh, quick poll here. And just thinking about this kind of tree structure, uh, do you think um, 
Do you think this kind of classification tree can be used to provide automated diagnostic feedback to test takers, given the current state of AI technologies? Okay, I see more optimism. All right, so I'm going to um, close the poll in a few seconds. Uh, so try to get your answers in quickly. Okay, great. Um, I'm ending it, uh, sharing the results. Um, so a lot of you think uh, that it's highly useful, right? Because the, the structure is very clear. It's uh, very transparent. Uh, so let's go back uh, to uh, this. Um, oh, I'm not able to, to go back uh, for some reason. Um, so if you think about that classification tree that I just showed you, what kind of features uh, it actually uh, used, right? Pronunciation, fluency. Uh, I think in that tree structure I didn't show, it also used a, a grammar feature. Uh, so all of those features are lower level features um, that, you know, tell you nothing about their, you know, coherence or the uh, quality of the argument or organization. I think sometimes we will be tempted to give students feedback, say, oh, if you improve your fluency, right, by this much, and then, uh, you know, you can get a score of two rather than one, right? But they probably have overlooked the fact that because of these complex constructs are not represented in the decision tree. So it could be that that student actually got a one because, you know, his or her coherence was really poor. Uh, so you would be, I think, you know, it should be very careful in providing feedback like, if you do this, you're going to get a higher score, you're going to improve your speaking skills. Uh, and given the current state of technologies, I think a more uh, sensible way to do this would be uh, to still provide feedback on these lower level features, right? But use self or peer assessment to uh, assess those more complex constructs uh, so that uh, you can actually provide more tailored, uh, you know, materials that address some of the more complex uh, aspects of uh, uh, language ability. So in this case, um, you know, we've talked about a lot of the uh, sort of applications, right, of uh, uh, machine learning and this black box approach. Uh, and we talked about some of the work uh, to make the black box more interpretable to users. And so you would be wondering, well, you know, do you ever think that a black box approach would be okay here? Uh, and as a matter of fact, I think some of the machine uh, learning methods like deep learning methods have significantly improved the prediction, right, the accuracy of the prediction. So we don't want to say no categorically, uh, but there are a few factors for us to consider here. Again, always the intended use, right? How is automated scoring going to be used? What are stakeholders' expectations? So if it's low stakes, with no expectation to provide diagnostic feedback, then I think it would totally be fine right, uh, to use a, a black box approach. Uh, if your automated scoring engine is being used as a check or a second rater, there's always the safety net of human raters. Yeah, go ahead and use it, right? Um, because it's, it's less important. You always have the, the rubrics and the human raters as the safety net. Um, in some context, I think a very high level of transparency to stakeholders would be expected. And you got no other choice but to use a very transparent scoring model where you can explain everything to your stakeholders. Um, 
And also regarding the components of uh, AI technology training, um, if it's sort of the scoring model, I think it depends, right? It depends on the context. If it's using, um, you know, a black box approach to train the speech recognition engine to extract uh, features for model building, uh, I think it should be fine because uh, users actually don't directly interact uh, with those uh, outputs. And as a matter of fact, um, if you, I don't know whether you followed the news in the development of uh, uh, machine translation of speech uh, years ago, and it was precisely because of the use of deep learning and training speech recognition models that led to breakthroughs in the uh, improvement of accuracy of uh, machine translation of speech. So they do bring a lot of benefits, uh, I think, to the AI world. And so I'm going to give you a couple of contexts where uh, the validation priorities are different. And also whether, you know, I'm going to discuss whether the black box approach uh, would be uh, sensible there. Uh, the first one is a formative assessment context but you need to provide diagnostic feedback, right? Uh, not just a score, but diagnostic feedback. In that case, two uh, most important inferences uh, would be evaluation and explanation, because you got to be able to explain that by addressing the feedback that I'm providing to you, you are going to improve your proficiency level, right? Uh, I think all these other inferences, you know, it will be sort of nice to have if you have additional evidence, great. Uh, but if you only have resources um, for a limited number of uh, uh, research projects, just focus on these two. Uh, and another context, uh, your test is being used for high stakes decisions and uh, automated scoring engine is being used as a second rater with adjudication. Uh, in this case, what's important uh, are uh, evaluation. So the accuracy of the scores and also very important score-based decisions and test use because you're looking at high stakes decisions uh, and whether the combination of automated and uh, human score uh, would be would provide useful information that leads to uh, accurate decision making appropriate decision making and whether there are any known negative uh, impact that is a result of the use of automated scoring also in this case it's totally fine to use a black box approach to train your automated scoring model because it's only being used as uh, a check or as the second rater, right? And still, I think despite uh, some of the benefits of uh, using deep learning models, uh, I still believe that construct inspired um, sort of feature extraction and model building would still be desired. Uh, because it allows you to be faithful to the construct that you want to measure, more interpretable, right, to test users, and more importantly, because it helps, up, helps all of us promote uh, AI assessment literacy, and AI should be a very important part of assessment literacy now, uh, given the increasing use of uh, AI assessments. And uh, the scoring features would also be uh, amenable to providing feedback. And so to be able to develop, um, you know, construct inspired automated scoring models, uh, obviously you're going to need uh, AI scientists and engineers, right? Uh, they are very critical, uh, but subject matter experts and psychometric experts are equally uh, important. Uh, because your subject matter experts can tell you, you know, whether your features are uh, rele relevant to the constructs that you want to measure and whether they could easily be gained, right? Uh, and, uh, you know, test uh, uh, the length of an essay is a good example. It's a very strong predictor, but it's uh, very easily uh, gained. 
Uh, they can also make sure that the application is uh, appropriate for the intended use. Um, psychometric experts, uh, interestingly, you know, because a lot of computational linguists actually have training right, in statistics. Uh, however, I think psychometric experts, uh, they could uh, make sure that uh, you actually uh, monitor all of the psychometric properties, not just the usual correlation and agreement. Uh, for example, a lot of the uh, work probably just overlooks, uh, uh, for example, the standardized differences between human and machine scores across different subgroups, uh, because the combination of, um, you know, different features sometimes would actually, automated features would actually favor or disadvantage a certain subgroup. And we have actually uh, uh, identified those issues in some of our own work. Uh, uh, back then uh, when we did uh, research on automated scoring. And also, most importantly, that uh, they can make sure there's no drift in machine scores in operational testing, because it's not a plug and play uh, solution. And you just like put it in there and, and hoping it will just take care of everything. Um, but if you think about your model training, right, if you use a multiple regression model, um, the, you know, slope and intercept, they are highly dependent on the population characteristics. If your population has shifted, then you've got to retrain the model to make sure that your machine scores are still accurate. Uh, so I think our psychometricians uh, would make sure that they actually monitor uh, the quality of uh, uh, machine scores. And that's something I think when you talk to an automated scoring provider, right, uh, that uh, uh, that level of uh, maintenance, uh, ongoing maintenance of their engine uh, should be sort of written into the service agreement as well. So, you know, going back to the questions that I raised uh, at the very beginning, I'm very glad to see that a lot of you uh, were thinking that, uh, you know, you need more information to decide, right? So what are some of the questions uh, that you could ask? Uh, the first question always, you know, what scoring features are used in the scoring model? Some of them may not, may be very reluctant to tell you. I uh, say, oh, these are, you know, secrets and we can't tell you and don't take the no for an answer uh, because I don't think it's rocket science. And there has been so much literature in academia and in the published work of some of the reputable providers um, that they have the obligation to tell you uh, what features are being used in the scoring model. Uh, and if possible, you know, how are the features combined to predict scores? Uh, and obviously, if it's a deep learning model, you can't really tell, but at the very least, you should scrutinize what they throw into that black box. Make sure that whatever they throw, right, uh, in there is uh, relevant to the construct that you want to measure. Uh, how accurate is the score prediction? I, you know, I don't need to talk about that. Everybody would ask that question. A question that uh, would be overlooked sometimes is did the scoring model training use score data where students were aware of machine scoring or inner workings of scoring? Uh, and interestingly, you know that, uh, you know, if students were aware of the inner workings of scoring, they would actually adopt different test taking strategies and their response characteristics would change, right? because they, you know, they would want to game the system to get a higher score. Uh, so that's something that we usually overlook. Um, and also the score consistency is just a routine question. Don't worry too much about that uh, because I, uh, we've always seen higher consistency of, uh, you know, uh, results from the use of uh, the automated scoring engine. Um, bias against certain groups, uh, that's very important to ask. And also if they have uh, a automated scoring provider has licensed uh, the engine to other users in a similar use context, ask them about whether uh, they've uh, seen any negative, uh, any unintended negative consequences as a result of using uh, the automated scoring engine.
So if you can ask, you know, all these questions, and I think, you know, they will be very impressed, right? Because, you know, uh, and that shows uh, yourself as a very savvy user. The hard part is actually to digest the information that they provide to you and be able to follow up, right? Ask the right follow-up questions and also evaluate the information that they provide to you. And that requires more experience and training. Um, and so I think it takes sort of the joint responsibility of the developer and the user for us to improve the AI literacy of our users. Uh, developers, definitely they have the responsibility to share relevant information about their engine with you. And you as the user, you know, you have the responsibility to improve uh, your own literacy. And at the same time, you have the rights uh, to actually demand information about how their AI engine works and how is it going to be used in my specific context and what quality standard would be acceptable uh, in my specific context. And I think opening this black box of automated scoring um, could start with uh, the training of cross-disciplinary talents. Uh, and I've been you know, advocating this for a long time. And I'm glad to see that some of the graduate programs actually have started to uh, you know, set up these uh, interdisciplinary programs like uh, Iowa State University is a good example, right? And then we would have applied linguists who understand language testing, understand educational measurement and statistics, and who also have a very deep knowledge about AI technologies. Uh, and they are the best group of people uh, to communicate the information about AI in a way that is accessible and uh, you know, understandable to our users, right? Because they understand education. Um, so this kind of more transparent communication about AI applications would help nurture savvy uh, AI technology users. Don't ever think that academics, right, professors, and you know, uh, you know, researchers could actually push automated scoring providers to change. No, we don't have that kind of power. Who does? The users, uh, because the users they pay, right? Uh, so our job is actually to get the users, uh, you know, to 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 actually to ask the right questions, probe for the right information. And that's the only way, uh, you know, where we can actually push for more thoughtful and responsible uh, AI uh, applications. So I think looking at, you know, all these recent advances in AI technology, they're kind of dazzling, right? Uh, overwhelming and, uh, you know, machine scoring and uh, big data have become the buzzwords and I even added them to, to the title of my presentation. Uh, but I think despite all of that, the fundamentals of the validity of automated scoring stay the same. Uh, but what needs to change is actually new guidelines for how to handle the emergence of deep learning methods because it's so prevalent right now, right? Uh, and users, usually the answer that they get is that this is the model that we use. We can't explain it. Just take it for whatever, you know, just, just whatever we tell you, right? Um, on the one hand, we don't want to stifle innovations because there are true benefits you know, from the use of deep learning models uh, in uh, developing AI technologies. Uh, but on the other hand, if you're dealing with very high stakes tests, using automated scoring as the sole rater and your uh, uh, stakeholders expect a very high level of transparency, uh, that's where the use of a black box approach uh, would be very questionable, right? Uh, so you need to think twice uh, in that kind of scenario. Uh, so thank you and uh, very glad to, you know, talk about this uh, topic that, very, that is very close to my heart. 
uh, and uh, be happy to take any questions uh, that you may have. Uh, I don't know, Mahid, uh, how you want to organize the Q&A, whether they could just type the questions into the chat box or uh, just uh, raise their hand uh, to raise questions. Thank you very much, Xiaoming. It was uh, interactive and really impressive. I learned a lot from your uh, talk and especially about the responsibilities of different stakeholders when it comes to assessments in general and AI-based assessments in particular. I do have some questions to ask, but I, I see that there are having one or two questions in the box, oh, okay. uh, in the chat box. I'm going to communicate them to you. I just read it out, so uh, we will make it more interactive. Uh, in the interest of time, um, I just quickly read it out. If oh, The first question is by Azrifa. Uh, uh, Azrifa is asking if ML scoring, I think machine learning scoring is based on human raters, is it uh, replicating the human biases, for example, the halo effect? How much has this been investigated or considered when an automated system is being used? Yeah, exactly. I think that's one of the major limitations of uh, developing automated scoring uh, models, right? Uh, because you're using human scores as the gold standard. Uh, and what we typically do in machine, uh, in training automated scoring models is that to be able to um, sort of reduce the bias or errors in human scores. Uh, you use uh, uh, average scores of at least two raters. Uh, in some cases, if you want your cleaning uh, training data to be really clean, uh, you actually use adjudicated scores, right? You use a panel of uh, raters, but it, it, it gets more expensive, I think, when you want high quality uh, labeled data. Uh, so I, I think a lot of uh, users uh, probably just use uh, single score data uh, as um, sort of the basis for training their automated scoring systems. Uh, and thus you are actually uh, sort of replicating the bias, right, in human ratings and some of the errors uh, into your uh, automated scoring engine as well. Great, Xiaoming. Can I build on that? Uh, sure. Since we're looking at a, uh, at like two possible scenarios, one scenario is to ask raters to rate a few or a number of papers, and then uh, train an algorithm to figure out uh, how to um, rate unseen batches of papers or uh, you know speech samples. Mm -hmm. You know, in in deep learning, um, as I'm not sure if it has been applied. I mean, you know better than me, uh, it has been applied to writing essays or uh, s speech samples or not. But for, uh, for example, computer vision uh, research, uh, nowadays deep learning can help to uh, tease out those features that can help you differentiate between different types of pictures. So human beings will basically be retired in those kind of projects. And they will have no roles in uh, sp specifying the features that can differentiate between different uh, pictures, graphs, et cetera. I was wondering if this approach could be amenable uh, in, in language assessment as well, uh, particularly mm. you were focusing on the importance of construct. Can we just let the machine to come up with its own idea and philosophy of the construct and give us something that has actually high prediction uh, rather than high explanation power? Mm, okay. Yeah, that's a very interesting thought. And if you think about some of them, maybe machine learning tasks, right? Uh, like uh, uh, image recognition. Uh, and I think uh, sometimes we have to do that as part of the authentication. And it's very frustrating. They're using yeah. us to collect data, right? For, for labeled data. <laughs> um, that's right. And, and uh, uh, you know, I, I think in, especially in language testing, we are dealing with very complex constructs. I would say communication skills are probably one of the most uh, complex constructs to, to measure, right? Uh, and I think as far as I know, uh, I, I think all of the applications, AI applications uh, in machine learning and language testing area are still supervised. 
So you mm. would still need labeled data, right? Uh, in some cases, meticulously labeled data uh, as sort of the uh, gold standard uh, for, for training the model. Um, and I think there could be instances where uh, so the unsupervised learning uh, could, uh, could be of help, of help uh, especially if the task is not uh, that complex uh, and maybe the machine uh, would be able to figure out the rules, right? Uh, so the right. scoring rules, yeah. Uh, in our field, I think it's probably uh, at, at least at this point, uh, I, I think, you know, we all dream of a day when you can just wire somebody and get a read on their, uh, you know, language ability, right? Uh, and we are not there yet. Uh, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's actually one of my dreams. Uh, I, I don't. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't think we, we, we can realize. We would be out that. of jobs. <laughs> right. Yeah. Absolutely. It reminds me of uh, uh, Agents of of the Shield. If you have watched it on Netflix. Uh, they have uh, created a lie detector and they call it the lie detector. It uses, uh, it's imaginary, no fictitious, but it uses 96 different uh, indices to predict whether someone is lying or not when they're sitting oh, on wow. the lie detector. And it works, uh, you know, because it's, it's uh, basically fictitious. It works properly. I think at some point in our future, maybe 20 years from now, we may be there. So all of us will lose our jobs. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I will have retired. So that's, that's fine. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So we have uh, a question from the audience. Zahra Yazdi is, uh, has been patiently waiting. Actually, you can open your microphone and ask the question or if Hello? you prefer. Oh, okay. Hello. Do you hear me? Oh, yes, well, yes, we do. Yeah. Uh, first of all, thank you so much uh, for your uh, great presentation. It was very fruitful. Sorry, I have one question. Uh, I saw uh, a word in your per, uh, present the slides, let's say, rubric process. Uh, I want to um, explain, uh, I want from you uh, explain more about this rubric process, uh, maybe in testing or, I don't know, rating? Oh, like a rubric-based uh, decision-making, is it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. rule-based or uh, performance uh, decision tree. So yeah, rubric mm -hmm. uh, is essentially um, the criteria, right, that we use to score a test. Uh, and usually there are descriptors of different levels. And we call that sort of the rubric uh, for, for scoring. Um, and, you know, uh, it, it can be used for uh, holistic scoring where you just give one impressionistic score, or uh, it can be used for analytic uh, scoring where you actually develop uh, sort of descriptors for different dimensions of mm -hmm. a construct. Yeah. Did yeah. that answer your question? Yes, yes. Thank you so much. Actually, I'm a BA student of ELT and, you know, I'm very low in this kind of issues. Uh, maybe this uh, question is so simple. Uh, oh, no, no. Uh, yeah. Well, this is a, uh, my understanding, this is like an interface uh, series and we actually welcome, uh, uh, yeah. you know, attendees from other areas and uh I think it would be very interesting to actually hear sort of the thoughts and the exchange of ideas, right, from yeah, uh, different disciplines. Uh, so we thank appreciate so the much. opportunity. Yeah. Thank you. Very nice. Uh, so I'm reading a, a comment here from Adil. I think it's, it's not a question, but a comment. Uh, Xiaoming, if you have another comment to add on to it, please go ahead. It mm -hmm. reads like this. I think that the integration of AI in all assessments will be of great value for our future generations. And we are keen on the use of up-to-date technologies to move forward for the welfare of our students. Do you think this, this will be to the welfare of our students in the future? Yeah, I think so. If you use it, uh, you know, responsibly, right, and mm -hmm. appropriately, and uh, I think the key is actually to improve the literacy of our uh, both our uh, teachers and also you, uh, uh, students, right, uh, who are users, uh, because you know, if you think about, for example, if you use automated scoring to provide uh, feedback. Uh, it, the, the feedback could be overwhelming, right? 
uh, because that's what a, a, a machine is good at, uh, providing very granular feedback on very granular features. Uh, <clears throat> to what extent you as a teacher, as a sort of a trainer, needs to actually um, adapt that information for your students, given their levels, right? Mm -hmm. uh, given their cognitive learning styles. Uh, and I think that's sort of the bigger question. And how do you actually make use of whatever automated scoring engine or automated feedback engine provides uh, in a way that would actually facilitate learning, not overwhelm them, right? Uh, and I think, um, so, so that's why I think, you know, developing AI uh, literacy is not simply just, you know, understanding sort of the, um, uh, you know, scoring model and, and all of that, but, but more importantly, how do you make use of the information uh, in a way that would benefit your uh, teaching and learning in a class? Very set? nice. Very yeah. nice. So uh, uses and interpretations of test scores. Uh, perhaps the legacy of Messick uh, applies here as well. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, thanks. The next question is about remarking or re-rating. Re remarking is possible when, it's from Sabine, by the way. Remarking is possible when using human raters and, and students can apply to get their tests remarked or re-rated. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the recourse for the test takers if they have queries regarding their machine learning scores, if any? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, yeah, usually I think a lot of the providers have, uh, provide this kind of appeal uh, mechanism, right? If you're, if you don't believe the score is an accurate reflection of your uh, ability level, you can actually appeal, right, uh, and have your essay or uh, uh, speaking test rescored. Uh, interestingly, if you feed the same response to the engine, I will give you the same score, right? Uh, so sort of appealing process for automated scoring really doesn't work. Uh, right. I, I think if they have queries regarding their uh, automated scores, uh, we've, we've got to use uh, human raters uh, to, to deal with their like uh, appeal request here. Right. And is, is there a chance that the score might change at all? You mean in, in your experience? <laughs> I mean, if a machine uh, rates the paper and then someone is not happy with the marks that they receive, then uh, they appeal. And is there a chance that if a human being reads the paper would give a different score on that? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Chances are very high. Uh, right. So if you look at uh, sort of the state of, state of the art of automated scoring engines, uh, the best it could do maybe would be, you know, somewhere if you think about absolute agreement, right, usually maybe 70%. Uh, so it would agree with uh, a human score 70% uh, of the time, and sometimes even lower, uh, depending on the complexity of the, of the task, right. Uh, and I've never seen an, uh, a test provider actually using um, uh, uh, sort of, if you think about the discrepancy rate that they use to adjudicate, right? If they use a right. human rater and an automated uh, uh, rater, uh, they usually allow for one score level difference, right? So if it's right. uh, zero to five, uh, if a machine gives it a two and a human gives it a three, they just average the two, okay. right? Uh, I've never seen a test provider where they adjudicate uh, everything uh, because that would be <laughs> cost prohibitive. So I would say at the individual level, you would still see, you know, quite a bit of errors. Uh, on average, you know, whether it's as good as uh, uh, human raters, right? And mm -hmm. because, you know, you've got stats to support there. And in many cases, it does emulate so at least a human human agreement right uh, because they don't agree all the time either so sometimes it's just sort of a pure luck right you get a different pool of raters and get a different raider and uh, they may actually right. give you a different score yeah exactly uh, that that could be a very big problem especially for uh, you know the main stakeholders of the test that who are the students actually right and they may be placed in a, in a wrong program and 
they could be put on a very different trajectory and that could affect the, the rest of their lives in right. some ways. Okay, so the next question is from Daniel. Uh, thanks for the inspiring talk. How do you comment on the possible consequence, the possible consequence validity of an automated scoring system applied in high stakes tests? Basically the consequential basis mm -hmm. of validity for AI based systems if they're applied in high stakes tests? Yeah, I think, um, you know, that's sort of the one billion dollar question, right? Uh, and mm. sadly, I think it is actually being used uh, in a lot of high stakes tests right now. Uh, and as oh, it, it's I, being used. So that's, that's my next question. I wanted to ask you, it is being used in, for high stakes decision yeah. making. Yeah, oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, we know a few, right, uh, that, that right. Uh, have already been used in a sort of uh, high stakes context. So mm -hmm. I think they kind of get away in terms of, uh, again, the, the, the training method may not be sort of a black box, right? right. Because some of them actually use traditional, um, you know, um, methods to train uh, their scoring model but they actually don't reveal everything about their automated scoring model. I think this is something that I've been really thinking about uh, because in their communication about their scoring model, they still give the, the users the impression that the scoring model looks at everything, right? Even some of the very complex constructs because the information that they provide to the public is very vague. Um, and so in a sense, you know, students actually don't really know what kind of features that they use in building the, the model for a specific task. Thus, it's actually difficult for them to try to game the system, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that's more of a sort of an ethical question, right? To what extent do we need to be transparent to our stakeholders about um, the, the, the inner workings of the algorithm. If you disclose everything, I think chances are given the current limitations of our scoring model, um, they could be gained. I would think, you know, probably 100% of the uh, scoring models out there can be gained in some fashion. If you didn't disclose information, right, critical information, would that be unethical, right? So I don't think our code of conduct and code of uh, good practice actually has caught up yet uh, with this kind of problem um, that, that uh, we are facing. So I think it's being used. Uh, it uh, probably would have a lot of consequences. Um, it's just right now, if we haven't resolved the issue of to what extent, what are test providers obligation right, in disclosing information about the automated scoring models that they use, uh, then, you know, it's, it's really hard uh, for us to actually um, uh, look at the impact, right? Uh, I think uh, uh, is it uh, uh, Jing Songfan and also Jing Yan, they did a very interesting study looking at uh, um, sort of the perceptions of, of uh, uh, test takers, I believe uh, regarding the PTE academic, uh, which is automatically scored. Uh, so I think, uh, you know, there are uh, studies that, uh, that have started to look at, uh, you know, these, the, the consequential aspect of uh, validity. Very interesting, very nice. And uh, Gwen is asking, I notice you worked a number of years in ETS in English language testing, including automated testing. Would you know how far this has progressed for mathematics? Oh, uh, mathematics actually, um, yeah, interestingly, uh, I think ETS does have a math uh, rater as well. Uh, it's, it's not as developed as sort of the uh, language test uh, uh, raters like e-rater and speech rater. Um, and as far as I know, I think um, that the progress for mathematics, uh, I'm not 
you know, very well aware of that, that, uh, you know, what's happening in that field. Uh, but I know what's happening very quickly is actually the recognition, uh, automatic recognition of handwritten answers for math and science exams. And there have been a lot of advances uh, in recent years um, because of the need to uh, score, uh, you know, mathematical and also science tests quickly, right? They usually scan handwritten, uh, you know, uh, 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 answer sheets and, and have them scored uh, by, by raters. Uh, there has been uh, a lot of advance uh, in terms of the recognition accuracy of, uh, you know, scientific uh, formula. Um, that I am very well aware of that uh, development. Very nice. And a similar question has been uh, asked by, by Eddie. Do you know of work on AI assessment for subjects with an aesthetic dimension, like arts, like music? Oh, yeah. I mean, not uh, as sort of, a, 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 you know, my academic interest, but, but I know that uh, uh, actually in, uh, in the music field, uh, now you actually have AI uh, uh, engines and tools that can help uh, learners practice, right? So because it actually can detect the accuracy of, uh, for example, students' uh, uh, piano playing. Uh, so instead of having like a tutor who's uh, a piano tutor who's with you all the time, uh, the automated engine can actually detect uh, errors, right, uh, in the learner's uh, 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 pl piano playing piece uh, and, and then, you know, provide feedback. Uh, and I think that really has been sort of a commercial product uh, that uh, uh, has been used uh, in some programs. Very nice. And Huawei is asking uh, a question about domains, domain specification. Uh, different language learning contexts lead to different target domains. Does this mean for each target domain, different target domain, a an individualized automated scoring system should be developed? Ah, good question. Um, I would say um, an individual, uh, a customized automated scoring system should be developed for each test and for each population. Uh, because it's very sensitive, first of all, to um, the, you know, the scoring rubrics, right? What human raters actually use to judge the quality of the output. And second, the performance of the automated scoring model relies on using the right training data, right? So if you're training a model for TOEFL, you have to use a representative sample right, uh, that is reflective of the proficiency range of your TOEFL students. Um, so I think there are a lot of common components and features that can be used uh, in the automated scoring model for different domains, right? Uh, because the domain actually uh, if you think about regardless of the domain, the underlying language abilities are actually very similar. So I think the features are reusable, definitely. But the scoring model always has to be trained, uh, retrained, not just for a different domain, but for a specific test using the right uh, population, the right representative uh, uh, data set. Yeah. Very nice. And... Uh... Tenny is thanking you for the inspiring presentation. And I also oh, would like you. to ask you maybe one or two more questions if, uh, if we do not have any other questions from the audience here. My first question is uh, prediction versus explanation. We, we, you talked about this very elegantly. I'm wondering, since um, our theoretical frameworks do not seem to be completely accurate and they, they're evolving over time, um, something that is more uh, acceptable, acceptable today may not be acceptable in 10 years from now. And people may, you know, with some hindsight, may look back and say, oh, that was very simplistic, actually. That theoretical framework based on which we develop tests was not as accurate as we thought. Um, so our, our theoretical frameworks evolve over time. Um, some 
uh, psychologists especially I, I haven't seen people in language many many papers in language assessment but some psychologists uh, think that it's a better idea to uh, put most of our eggs into the basket of prediction prediction of future behaviors rather than explaining what is going on under the test condition. Uh, where do you come down on that? Hmm. Yeah, and really good question. Uh, again, I think, you know, a, a good answer would be it, it depends, right? I think in some contexts, uh, you could actually turn it into a more straightforward prediction uh, question. If, say, depending on the use of the instrument, right? Um, for example, if you just you need to use a, a sort of a quick, dirty, quick and dirty measure uh, to measure somebody's proficiency in the domain, it doesn't have to be language, right? Um, then in that case, I, I think as long as you have an accurate prediction, of uh, you know that student's uh, proficiency level, right? And then it should be fine. Going back to the validity framework, as long as that evaluation inference is sufficiently supported, you would be fine, right? right. And you know, I think in a lot of the low stakes context, it would be okay. Uh, the reason why we insist that. The, it should be the, the bigger explanation inquiry. It's because we know that our tests, especially high stakes tests, they have a lot of impact on how uh, you know, a, a subject is learned and taught at school, right? So that's why I think we have to insist on providing enough evidence for that explanation inference and turn it into an explanation problem, right? right. Um, because otherwise uh, you would have, you know, all learning and instructional practices be driven more by the prediction, which would be a reduction of the construct. Uh, you know, I don't know whether that- uh, Yeah, that's great. Thank you. And- uh... Well, okay, uh, Eddie's question has come in, so I, I'm going to prioritize that. Uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Shi. A further question, what about assessments uh, that is of a more subjective nature, not so much accuracy in music, but for, for example, how beautiful an artwork is? Have there been any attempts at using a black box approach for such kinds of assessing? Well, yeah, yeah, I would think so. Uh, yeah. And especially for those more complex constructs, right? I mean, language is probably complex enough. Mm -hmm. uh, if you think about, uh, you know, the judgment of uh, language skills, it's highly subjective, right? Uh, depends on sort of whether you think uh, listener effort is required, whether you think the uh, if, uh, communication is effective or not. Again, uh, you know, in those cases, uh, I, I think uh, what I've seen is mostly uh, still super, supervised uh, methods, right? Uh, use human to label, uh, even for artwork uh, that is very subjective. I mean, especially, uh, except for those like, you know, uh, abstract, uh, you know, kind of genre, right? Uh, where there could be very uh, different opinions, uh, typically, right. When it's a great piece of art, a lot of people would agree, right? It's a, a great piece of art. Uh, so, and then you try to articulate, you try to get them to articulate. Why do you think, you know, why you think that's a masterpiece? Is it the contrast, the use of the colors, right? I, I'm not an artist, and, and, mm. you know. So, so then you could still decompose uh, sort of the features that they attempt to. Uh, and, uh, and, and try to uh, uh, compute automated features uh, uh, to predict their subjective uh, judgments. Very nice. Xiaomi, I just realized I forgot to ask you to unshare your screen. So when you're speaking, you're, uh, you will be more visible to people. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All my right. fault, sorry. No problem. Right. Okay, so let's uh, uh, just you know talk about my last question. I think that should be the last question of this uh, uh, installment of interface as well, because I don't really want to take more, your time more than this. Um, it's the question about the, the black box approach and uh, our knowledge of what is going on inside the box. Uh, 
uh, you talked about it, but I want to add on to uh, or build on what, uh, what you presented in your talk. Uh, let's say we learn about what is inside the box. And I think in the past, around 2014, we did a study of, of this nature and we used the so-called black box approach and we compared it with a sort of white box approach. We compared artificial neural networks with um, um, ANFIS, which is a neurofuzzy approach um, that uses uh, artificial neural networks. So we managed to uh, suss out some of those rules. And when they came out of the, the engine, uh, there were actually a bunch of mathematical rules. And we were just looking at them and saying, hmm, they're very interesting. But um, personally, I didn't have much use for them. I was wondering if that is what you're referring to, or did I misunderstand you? Or if, if, when you say that we need to know what's going on inside the black box, uh, what does that mean exactly? Um, okay, so it could be mean a few different things, right? Uh, is if we are talking about like a black box approach to model training, like uh, one of these deep learning models, right? Could be uh, DNNs or RNNs, right? Uh, one of those. Uh, I think there have been a lot of efforts to try to make the inner workings uh, of, of the algorithm more transparent. Although it's not going to be as straightforward as a decision tree, it's not going to be as straightforward as a multiple regression, right? right. Uh, and even if you think about random forest, it's a collection of classification trees. You can explain one classification tree, but you can't explain a hundred classification trees, right? right. Uh, because they kind of vote uh, for the right class. Uh, so. I, I think, you know, uh, for example, I, the, the example that I gave uh, sort of, uh, uh, you know, um, where you could look at the relative importance of different features uh, in the model training, um, that, that would be one approach. And there are many other approaches uh, that machine learning scientists have uh, actually developed in recent years. So that's one dimension sort of of opening that black box, right? It's uh, an inherent black box that needs to be opened. The second black box that I'm referring to is actually relates to uh, automated scoring providers reluctance to open it. And it's in some cases, it's a very simple box. <laughs> it's, you know, right. you know what's going on right now, but because they have something to hide or, you know, they, they don't want to expose the simple algorithms right in their like uh, a simple box uh, because it could be easily gained. Uh, so, so I think that's something where we need to, I think we as a field need, need to focus on sort of opening that black box, right? Uh, I think the first one is more of a scientific uh, inquiry whereas the, the second one uh, I think it's more of a social inquiry uh, as uh, educational uh, measurement practitioners, as language testers, uh, we have this obligation, right? Uh, a social responsibility to help open that black box uh, so that the users are, are more educated. Uh, because as I said earlier, academics like us, uh, we can't get automated scoring providers to change. Only the users can, right? Uh, the only way to equip them uh, is to actually equip them with the knowledge uh, so that they can actually push the uh, automated scoring providers to open that black box. Very nice. And that's a very important concern, uh, which stresses the significance of raising people's awareness about uh, their rights, about their rights as a stakeholder when it comes to assessments, and also the responsibilities of a, a test developer, the responsibility to be uh, transparent and provide information that the uh, consumers of their products are supposed to know. Mm -hmm. Right, and that brings us to the end of uh, interface two. I'd like to thank you very much again, Xiaoming, for the wonderful presentation. I just can't tell you how much I enjoyed it. Thank uh, you. I really appreciate it. And by the way, for uh, for the audience, uh, we're gonna. Um, upload this the video of today's presentation to uh, the uh, my YouTube channel uh, Statistics and Theory. I've just uh, left the comments uh, the uh, link there for you 
please visit that. I will also announce it on uh, me, uh, what is it called? The uh, social media, uh, LinkedIn and uh, Twitter. So if anyone likes to watch the uh, video again, you can just go ahead and, and watch it. Any final remarks, Yaming, before we close it? <laughs> well, thank you, Vahid, uh, for this opportunity. And uh, I, I think, uh, you know, the questions were great. Uh, we had a, a really interactive discussion. And uh, it's really nice to, to actually hear those different voices from different disciplines, right? Uh, and uh, because I think earlier on, I think I stayed in uh, language testing, we kind of spoke the same language, right? Uh, but but now I think I'm hearing much broader uh, perspectives uh, from the field, uh, from different disciplines, uh, and that was very uh, inspiring. Uh, thanks again, uh, Vahit, uh, for uh, inviting me to this uh, interface uh, talk series. Thank you very much. It has been a great pleasure. And thank you, everybody, uh, for uh, your great questions and attending our webinar. Please uh, attend the future webinars. Uh, they're going to be interface three and, and hopefully more than that. Thank you again and have a great day. Thank you and have a Thank great you. weekend, everybody. Thank you. You too.